Thank you all again for being here today. Thanks to the RNE board. Thanks to Sumitomo for being our annual sponsor. Thanks to NDSU, as well as University of uh, uh, Minnesota Administration for continuing this program now. Uh, it started way back in 1967. We will start in another minute. And our first speaker this afternoon will be Mr. Jacob Rickus, and his co-author is Dr. Mark Botel. His presentation will be on impact of insecticide, fungicide, starter fertilizer combinations on root maggot control and yield. Jacob, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for sticking around for the afternoon. Appreciate that. Um, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Um, our pot location was up at St. Thomas. Uh, you can call that the mega capital of the world. I think that's what we nickname and, and joke around about. Um, it was planted on May 19th, uh, this last summer of 2020. Um, the plot size is six rows uh, wide by uh, 35 feet long. And only the center four rows are treated and then rows one and six are uh, active as a unchecked buffer. And then uh, it was replicated uh, four times in a randomized complete block design. Uh, three performance assessments were done on this test. Uh, three stand counts were taken uh, at 35, uh, sorry, 37 days after planting, 49 days, and now also at 62 days. Uh, I do want to say that uh, at this point that we had a lot of environmental factors that contributed uh, to this test, and it wasn't just affecting uh, this test, but it was affecting the entire site. Uh, so we saw a lot of uh, differences among just with uh, uh, significant uh, rain events. Um, there were a couple of rain events in June where we got over two inches in less than a few hours. Um, but uh, that also hindered uh, later stand count dates. Um, and then also we did uh, root ratings. We took 10 samples per each plot. And uh, we did those on the very outside rows of rows two and uh, uh, rows five of the uh, treated areas in the plots. And then the center two rows, rows three and four, were uh, harvested for a total of 70 feet for the uh, uh, recoverable sucrose yield. And then uh, all those assessments were then uh, ran through the uh, SAS program uh, with a uh, uh, significant difference very, uh, variable of 5% of error. Uh, this first slide here, or uh, this first uh, bar graph here I'm showing here uh, is the uh, injury that was uh, done in this trial. And um, it, it's kind of a flip. Uh, the lower the value on that on that bar is, is, is the better or the cleaner the beet is. So and then the higher uh, the bar is uh, the more damage. Uh, the traditional root ratings, uh, is uh, a range of a zero to nine uh, as illustrated here on the left, but we kind of zoomed it in a little bit more here uh, with a nine so, or uh, with a seven to kind of just uh, blow it up a little bit for everyone to see nicely. Um, so uh, these four treatments here, uh, it's not said or written out or anything, but they do have more of a, a diagonal line Q that indicates that that was uh, fertilized or uh, had uh, 103400 uh, put in a DIF or a dribble and furrow. So, um, and what I want to point out here is that the, the, the check and the uh, fertilizer check uh, definitely stood out pretty good with some significant damage. Uh, we, we definitely did have some good mega pressure up there this year, despite the heavy rains. Um, but uh, uh, we can definitely see a clear uh, division two between these uh, first sets here, which is only one singular 
uh, application of uh, insecticide, which was counter 20 G. And then at the below here, uh, at the bottom of the basis of each bar graph or yet each bar indicates the, uh, the rate that that was applied. And then, but uh, this groupings here is only just with one uh, insecticide, whereas these lower groupings here or lower value on bars uh, had two insecticides on it, uh, being uh, Yuma, which is a uh, generic version of uh, Copyrophos, uh, but it is uh, has the same uh, AI active ingredient concentration that of Lowers Band 4E. Um, and then uh, we also did combinations here with uh, thiamet as well for another comparison, per, uh, comparative purpose. Um, but then uh, we also did uh, asteroid in there uh, that uh, we mixed that in with together with the 1034O. And uh, we also did uh, the, the post treatments for the second round of insecticide uh, in these three uh, purple uh, uh, bars here. Um, we did a, a tech mixture of Yuma with Quadris. Um, and then that also got banded on. Uh, it wasn't put on by broadcast. And then uh, we also did here uh, uh, a treatment here with com combined with Thymet with a, a, a Quadris band on that at the same time as well. And then uh, all these uh, post insecticides too were uh, applied uh, one day pre-peak, and that is uh, not ideal. That is certainly wasn't the intent of what we wanted, um, but uh, we, it did show, however, that uh, even with such a late application of insecticide, we still did have some good uh, reactions and uh, results from that, from just getting that application on. So here we have some uh, root comparisons uh, that we dug up later in, I do, I think that was damage rating was the end of July. Um, up here on the upper left is the uh, check and the DR up here means the, the average damage rating that it was, uh, that it was assigned uh, for that particular treatment. Um, and you can see that we have a lot of, uh, uh, just the mass of the beets itself are severely reduced. You can just see that the, they're just smaller and a lot more root and fibrous. Um, you can see here that uh, we probably have some pretty good uh, maggot pressure on, on these uh, smaller roots here and uh, some tap roots are probably taken out as well, uh, creating more of that sprangled uh, growth. Um, and below is also the fertilizer check and also showed that there is some pretty good significant pressure in that as well with this darkened scarring as well, which is a, uh, uh, a characteristic of the uh, maggot feeding. And then uh, to the two pictures on to the right then um, would be the uh, hot, or I would say over these two treatments were probably the best performing out of this, out of this test. And uh, you can see a nice clear difference between the checks and the, uh, the good uh, double uh, insecticide programs. And you can see that the roots are a lot cleaner, uh, a lot more, more, more uniform compared to the checks. And uh, you, you see that uh, a reduction of that scarring. So it's working there. And also this would be, uh, Similar carrying on, I, got, I think it was, I do believe that same treatment uh, down below the check that we saw earlier. But uh, these are some of the, the root comparisons of uh, two different rates of, of the counter, but combined with the asteroid and the fertilizer. And uh, we are still seeing some pretty good scarring, uh, even, even in the, with a, a good, uh, uh, high rate of counter, we're still getting some pretty good mega pressure and some good damage here. Um, this uh, is a bar graph indicating the uh, stand counts uh, for the season. Uh, I didn't include the 37 day uh, stand count because there were no significant differences on that. Um, but uh, I, I kind of wanted just to, uh, to illustrate here that there is some pretty good differences here between these single treatment insecticides 
and then also compared to the uh, double treatments here. And then the, uh, the checks are definitely showing up here too, that we have some good control here. But uh, in between you know, the, the differences though, between the treatments, we're not seeing too many differences uh, between the double action and the single action insecticides here. And uh, I did want to clarify too, that uh, these uh, uh, letters shared here, uh, these groupings, letter groupings are not to be shared between the two here, uh, the side-by-side -side bars. Um, each, it's, it's the colors that are being separated by letter values. Um, so I hope that clarified that for everybody. Um, let's see here. Here's some good pictures of just the foliage throughout the season too. Uh, I do believe that these pictures are taken uh, late June. Um, again, the checks are on the left and we can see some very good significant uh, pressure, root maggot pressure, not only in the, the check rows, but actually in the plot itself. Um, and here on the top two here uh, from center to the right, uh, or just the standalone uh, counters at uh, 7.5 pounds and also at the high rate of 8.9. Um, and then down below, we, it, it was just added with 10.34.0. And you can see a little bit more of a, a, a leaf growth I would, or more coverage. Uh, you can see a little bit more re, redu uh, reduced visibility uh, in, those, in between those rows. So there might be just a slight, slight foliar uh, gain from with the fertilizer. And then here is with the asteroid added on to that as well, and we see just a little bit more uh, coverage in between those rows. Um, but then you uh, compared to the uh, double insecticide applications uh, with uh, the high rate of the counter of 8.9 pounds added on with uh, thymet at seven pounds. And with the quadrus being with the one, we've got some really good can uh, canopy closure here uh, with these two treatments. And here's the uh, comparisons between the uh, Yuma treatments as well. And uh, the, the canopy closures are, are, are almost as good, just as good as the uh, thymets. But uh, visually on top, you can't really def uh, separate any differences hardly between these uh, Yuma treatments and these combinations. And then going into the recoverable sucrose yield, um, it de again does show that there's kind of, there is a separation here between the double insecticides uh, combinations with the single insecticide. Um, we are seeing a little bit more of a, a, a gain here with the asteroid, just slightly, if anything, it's just numerical, but uh, there is no significant differences between these uh, groupings here, uh, be it that they share letters. Um, but uh, the double insecticide treatments, that they do a, a pretty good job for uh, recoverable sucrose. And then obviously the uh, checks are, are down really, uh, the values of, for the checks are uh, down too for the recoverable sucrose. Um, we did uh, notice and record uh, a slight curling response. Uh, Mark, Mark went through a lot of work and, and uh, found some good photos here. Um, we think uh, it's not definitive at all, but we did notice in the asteroid uh, combination treatments that we were getting uh, some curling response here on the outside of the leaf margins. And uh, more specifically, it seemed that you could see a lot of that more happening towards the new leaf growth as well. So, um, we don't know exactly if that's a, a, of a response of maybe a too hot of a mixture uh, going down at plant all at once. Um, it's definitely something that we need to look at, look at uh, in the future and keep uh, an extra eye out for. Here's your, uh, your return uh, over the check treatment. Um, I guess the, the, the take home issues on this chart that I would like to illustrate is that uh, the 
again, the, the double insecticide treatments are, 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 you're getting a lot of good return having that extra uh, application of insecticide on top um, compared to just uh, the standalone while single time, uh, so or the single application of insecticide. Um, in, su in summary, um, there are, like I mentioned, uh, there are slight visual symptoms of negative response uh, with that asteroid and that starter fertilizer combination at both rates of the counter. Um, but there was no significant differences between uh, with the, the damage ratings or the um, uh, recoverable sucrose. So we, numer uh, statistically, we didn't see that any uh, difference there just the visual on top. Uh, and then there's no significant uh, yield re uh, revenue decreases from applying oxytocin uh, either be it with uh, the quadrus combinations with the Yuma or with the uh, combinations of asteroid at, at plant. Um, and it's a concurrent uh, with also with the counter or thymet. Um, and I, we, we really feel that this research should be repeated again, being that it had uh, a lot of uh, environmental influence on that. And uh, if so, if it could be done, uh, we would like to try to replicate that in a non-pest scenario to try to separate even more, uh, eliminate some more influential uh, factors to see if there is any damages with these uh, combinations. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the, the Sugar Beet uh, Research and Education Board and their funding for our program. Uh, I'd like to also thank egg industry uh, uh, businesses uh, for the chemical and the seed for these trials. I'd like to thank our cooperator, Wayne Lassard, up in, uh, you know, in St. Thomas. He's really uh, great to work with. Um, I'd like to thank two of my fellow research colleagues here at NDSU, and also a collaborative work with the uh, USDA. Um, thank, for, thank you for all their hard efforts too with uh, sprays and uh, harvest, pro, uh, harvest operations throughout the year. And I'd also like to thank my, uh, my hardworking summer assistants this year, uh, Zane uh, Miller, Brett Scarta, Keenan Stoltenow and Claire Stoltenow. Uh, they're, they're the ones that do all the, the, the good work to get, get all this data put together. So. I very much appreciate their help on that. And with that, do we have any questions? Uh, Jake, uh, there is one question in the uh, Q and A. Uh, I think probably you should uh, take that there. Okay. And uh, yeah. I can also answer that later as well for Deanne. Uh, okay. But we probably better move on to the next uh, presentation. Sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. Okay, our next speaker will be Dr. Mark Botel, worked on by himself and uh, Mr. Rickos, evaluation of experimental and newly registered insecticides for root maggot control and the 2021 forecast. Dr. Botel, thank you. So uh, what I'm gonna be presenting today is uh, uh, the, as the title implies, uh, work on newly registered as well as experimental insecticides. And uh, my title each year for this presentation is a little bit clunky because I also like to present uh, information on what we're expecting with the, uh, as a forecast for the sugar beet root maggot. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the insect, the, it's a uh, fly species and uh, it, the uh, larval stage is the only stage that damages the plant and they damage it by using oral hooks. As the uh, information there in front of you shows, they can cause pretty significant yield losses if not adequately controlled. And uh, as Jake had uh, shown, we, uh, we uh, rate injury on the zero to nine scale of Campbell et al. And I've done some preliminary work uh, on a number of years worth of research or uh, uh, research trials, and uh, we've correlated uh, yield and and revenue with the root injury rating scale. And for it's not necessarily a fully linear response, but uh, 
but uh, for every point on that zero to nine scale, uh, you can lose over 700 pounds of recoverable sucrose per acre. And uh, for if our, any of our international friends are still in the audience, that's about 800 kilograms per hectare. Uh, my materials and methods are pretty similar to uh, uh, those of uh, that Jake had uh, nicely outlined. Uh, one exception would be the bottom line there. Uh, I've got one trial where I've got a combined analysis, and whenever I do those, I do uh, check for treatment by year interactions and uh, uh, before I proceed with actually uh, doing the full combined analysis. And it was valid for the comparison that you'll see later in the presentation. So now I'll jump right into the data and these will go kind of quickly because I want to get to that forecast as well. Um, this is a uh, single year uh, uh, evaluation that we uh, performed this past growing season. And despite those challenges that uh, Jake had mentioned, uh, we got some encouraging results. Um, I've got the uh, blue rectangle that's outlining the top five performing treatments. I, I realize they're not necessarily all statistically better than some of the other treatments, but these are the five treatments that were statistically superior or different above the untreated check in regard to both recoverable sucrose and tons of root yield per acre. Uh, the first of which was the what we might consider an industry at plant standard or long stand, very commonly used pro product, counter 20G, at its high labeled rate. And then next we have Yuma, which is a uh, generic or a secondary manufacturer's product of, uh, of chlorpyrifos at its maximum labeled rate. Uh, one thing I should point out on this chart is that all these applications, all these treatments were a single application. So either a at plant or as you see in the bold parenthesized uh, or notations, uh, peak fly, a single peak fly with no at plant. So these are not what we would recommend, but we're, we did this to, so we don't have any other uh, uh, companion treatments or dual applications to cloud the performance. We just wanna see whether we're kind of getting uh, some hits on, on possible uh, products that, or treatments that might be incorporated into a dual program later on. Uh, next, we have Endigo uh, ZCX. We've been looking at Endigo uh, the uh, last uh, couple of years or few years. Uh, this is the first year we got to work on the ZCX formulation, and uh, it was not outperformed by the uh, the uh, by counter at its high rate. So that was encouraging as was Asana when we combined it with Exponent. And Exponent is a, a synergistic material. It's not an insecticide, but it's a, it's the active ingredient is a piperonyl butoxide. And that is known, been shown, demonstrated to uh, heat up or synergize the activity of pyrethroid insecticides. And Asana is a pyrethroid. Um, the moderate rate of counter uh, also performed pretty well. Um, like I said, uh, some of these others uh, weren't necessarily terrible, but uh, and we had a, a lot of variability in this. As Jake had mentioned, the heavy rainfalls that uh, made it so our applications were not timed as optimally as we would want, and a lot of water is something you don't necessarily want uh, in, in those heavy um, two inch rainfalls in a day kind of thing to, to actually dilute your material that you've applied. So, uh, but I think these results are encouraging. Uh, this is what the plots look like. I'll kind of skim through these. I've also got uh, root injury ratings uh, that you can see there. We've got Asana by itself. Uh, and then in the center, Asana with the Synergist, you can see a little better canopy closure there. Uh, similar, uh, uh, Endigo had a pretty nice looking stand and quite healthy looking plants there as well. And this, these photos would have been taken, I think, in um, early, around July 10th or so. So there was still a little more damage to occur from the root maggots. Um, and then there are our uh, comparative treatments on the bottom. Fairly good root maggot pressure in this trial. 
uh, our second study of three that I'll be presenting. This, this is three treatments that have been common to our MIDAC and BiVendor work over the, the last three years. So as you can see in the upper right corner, it's 2018 through this past year. And uh, we do have root injury rating uh, da data on this as well, and it very much corresponds with the yield data in this case. Uh, but these three treatments were common to all three of those years. And what we see here, I've been getting a lot of questions on, you know, you know, interest in MIDAC and, you know, how does it perform relative to the products we know a little more about? And it appears this, this data would suggest pretty strongly that it, it is, performs at a very comparable level to the moderate rate of counter, the 7.5 pounds which is just, it's 84% of the full rate. Uh, the MIDAC in all cases or all years was applied dribble and furrow as Jake had described. Uh, next, I've got a data slide from our uh, third study presenting today. This one's kind of busy, but I've got it color coded uh, in a similar manner that uh, Jake had described for his. These are stand counts, uh, number of plants per 100 feet of row. Uh, they were, these were a, um, these were taken at a point where not a whole lot of root maggot feeding injury had taken place, or at least plants had not been taken out uh, to any significant extent at this point. So really what we're looking at is stand establishment. And uh, so the clustered bars, usually have, they will always have a common element. In this case, the orange ones or yellow on your uh, far left are uh, counter at a couple of different rates, either alone or concurrent, not, not mixed with, not put in the furrow with, but uh, dribbled in furrow with a banded application of counter. And then next in green, we've got MIDAC, two different placement methods. And then the bar that has the texture to it included a post-emergence application of Bifender as a broadcast application. And that, as Jake, Jake had mentioned, this one actually was even a little later. It was one day after peak fly, which was not what we preferred, but we had not only all of that rain, but we had days and days of wind that was uh, hovering around eight, 18 to 23 miles per hour and in small pot plot work, uh, you really can't, can't risk uh, drift into another plot. So we had to wait. Um, the next cluster of bars is Pancho Beta as the base treatment. All of those had 10340 starter fertilizer with them in a T-band. And then the second two, the two Pancho Beta bars that have texture uh, pattern to them, uh, one, they both had MIDAC. And then the, the very far right one included Asteroid 1034-0 and MIDAC on Poncho Beta treated seed, um, all of those being T-banded. And then the treatments are going to repeat to the next slide, so I'm kind of going through them more thoroughly here. Uh, we had two rates of Bifender, and uh, both of those were T-banded. We found that pyrethroids tend to do better as a T-band, so we we did that with Bifender, which is Bifenthrin. And then we have our fertilizer controls using the two placement methods and then an untreated check. Uh, no significant differences in stand establishment, which usually no differences is pretty boring. Maybe it is today at this, this hour in the afternoon, but it's actually a good thing suggesting that we didn't have any significant deleterious effects on, on stand establishment. Similar to Jake's study, we did see there was a numerical reduction in stand. I can't even call it a reduction, but at least something to maybe uh, bear uh, suggestion that we should uh, continue looking at this further with the high rate of counter and the dribble and furrow of the 1034-0. Uh, same treatments. This is recoverable sucrose per acre, and it, it is in pounds. Uh, essentially, we don't have, as, as uh, you saw in Jake's presentation, within these clusters, as far as like rate or tank mix, or not tank mix, but concurrent application uh, partners, if you will, we didn't see any significant 
differences, uh, reductions in yield from, for instance, in the counter group, the dribble and furrow of the the uh, fungus or the uh, the fertilizer. Uh, again, numerical with both treatments, but but not significant. Uh, MIDAC, uh, I would say this mainly suggests that dribble and furrow is probably going to be a little more efficacious, but I can't even declare that because these two bars are have at least one letter in common. Uh, the broadcast wasn't really effective of the bifender, but again, I think that has a lot to do with, with timing because it was really applied about four days later than I would have wanted. So we need to look at that further. Um, this was kind of a surprising trend, at least within the Pancho Beta group. Uh, the Pancho Beta alone with 1034O, um, and then we start adding components, adding MIDAC, and then adding asteroid, you'd kind of think the more you're loading on there, um, you might be having a negative impact on yield. But th this is difficult to separate out because you've also got insect pressure. And uh, even some of the fungicides are no have been known to have some ac insecticidal activity. I'm not necessarily suggesting that, but um, we, we got good, good protection of yield and good performance out of this uh, sort of the kitchen sink uh, treatment here. Uh, no significant difference between the two rates of Bifender, although the pattern of performance suggests maybe that higher rate is better. Uh, this is really the rate, by the way, is 10.97, but uh, in the interest of space, I round it up for a presentation's sake. Uh, and then we, we did have significant reductions in yield, not necessarily due to fertilizer, but we had these were unprotected as far as an insecticide. So summing up the insecticide work, uh, first the, the experimental entries in these trials by Fender, the high rate uh, was comparable and not statistically outperformed by counter at either rate. Uh, indigo, uh, similar, and so it looks promising as an experimental, and I believe both are being pursued for registration in sugar beet, so that's very good news. And uh, the, the catch is we need to look at this further because we independently started looking at indigo, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it looks promising, but we've only looked at, uh, I believe, the last, uh, or I believe we've only looked at at plant applications. So we need to pursue this further with research on foliar applications. Uh, with the registered materials, Asana was, I would say performance was at least uh, enhanced by exponent. There was not a significant difference between the Asana alone and the Asana with exponent, but, uh, but we, but when by adding the exponent, it bumped the performance up to where it was not statistically outperformed by any of the other, um, the standard materials that we tested. MIDAC, sorry, I'll go back. One more minute, DAC, Mark. Pardon me? Another minute. Okay. So uh, the, the big thing on this insecticide stuff is uh, we didn't see negative impacts from uh, adding 1034O with the application but we need to test this further because it's a small data set, uh, one real good year of it. And uh, there were those slight trends with the 10, 10 34O. So um, here's what uh, we're looking like, uh, the root maggot uh, situation uh, in 2020. 2020 replaced 2019 as the second highest root maggot fly activity year valley wide in the last 14 years. So we're not, we're not winning the battle. So we have work to do in uh, regard to research and, uh, and on the farm really. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to help growers deal with that. Uh, as far as what the forecast looks like for 2020, here's what our forecast looked like in 2017. Trending upward, 2020 looked like that. And this, and it came to bear and this is what we're expecting for 2021. The point, thing to point out here is that the high, the intense pressure is, is increasing within these 
orange orbs. And then we've got a new area on the map that we haven't seen for probably six years, and that's six or eight years down in the Sabin and Bacon, Baker area. So uh, that's a concern as well. I'll be presenting more of this to, at grower meetings to show you where we expect high and moderate risk. But I'll, I'll wrap it up with an acknowledgement of all of these entities that helped our our uh, research succeed. And I want to especially thank the R&E board for their, uh, their uh, confidence and funding in our program. And uh, please do ask questions in the chat if you, uh, if any come up or feel free to email me as well. All right, thank you, Mark. If there are any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box. Our next speaker will be Dr. Daniel Kaiser, and he's from the University of Minnesota. His topic is, what are biostimulants and are they worth applying? So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is I'm just gonna go over a little bit of the work that we did with funding that we received from the r &E board, focusing on biostimulants. And what I'm gonna talk more about are some of the things that we've been seeing with that. I'll just kind of give you an idea in a couple of classes we're looking at and um, where we're at kind of moving forward with some of this, this particular work. So with biostimulants right now, there's currently no legal definition. Uh, there was some work being done on that um, in Europe. Um, they've been farther along when it comes to some of the definitions on some of this. Uh, the European Biostimulants Council defines them as substances or microorganisms whose function when applied to plants or the rhizosphere is to stimulate natural processes to enhance benefit, nutrient uptake, nutrient efficiency, tolerance to abiotic stresses and crop quality. Another definition for biostimulants would be substances or microbes that provide are provided in minute quantities promote plant growth. Um, these substances aren't fertilizers, uh, they're not pesticides and they're not soil conditioners. So they're, it's slightly nebulous in terms of the regulation on some of these products, although some of them would fall in line with um, potentially some of the fertilizer amendments products that are completely out there. So if you look at the products themselves, there have been a number of products that have been marketed for years, many years. And if you are interested in looking at any data, you can check out um, the regional NCRA 103, the regional compendium that uh, myself and Dave, Dave Franson are involved with, where you can search uh, some of the past research on some of these particular products, particularly if you know the active ingredient that's really important to do a, a search on this particular uh, site to see if you can find any data that's been done in the past. But again, a lot of these things aren't necessarily new. There's just been a new spin in terms of how the industry has been looking at them to try to develop these products and uh, market them for agriculture. So categories of biostimulants, um, these are the kind of the five, uh, one being humic substances, um, two amino acids and other nitrogen compounds, uh, three chitosins. Uh, this highlighted ones are what I'm going to talk about further because these are some of the products that we tested in the, um, the trials this year. Uh, four seaweed extracts and then five, uh, you know, probably where we see the most market growth right now is in beneficial microorganisms, which can include both bacteria, um, which um, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria are, are kind of one of those things and also free living nitrogen fixers, which is probably the biggest market in uh, part we see market share right now uh, moving forward. And then also fungi themselves. And one thing with this, if you're looking at these products, uh, you can find products that contain some of these sources individually, but many of them are kind of a cocktail of a, a number of these particular products that are meant to do different things, just depending on, on the microorganism itself that's, that's in the product mixture. So the first product I'm gonna talk about are chitosins. Um, these are linear polysaccharide compounds um, composed of glucosamine. Um, where these come from is uh, the treatment of shrimp, um, which contain chitin in their outer shells with sodium hydroxide, and they can form a liquid product when added to your fertilizer tank, makes your tank smell like a shrimp cocktail is what I've tend to found. But um, the uses of these products, um, they use them in cancer treatments, uh, dietary supplements, uh, wine making, and then also agriculture. The effects of them and what I've seen, particularly with sugar beet production, um, with both seed treatment and foliar application, they've been looking at it for disease suppression. And the most common thing that I found in, in looking at some background information was work in the Middle East, um, where they were looking at it um, for rhizoctonia uh, suppression. I haven't seen anything with other diseases like Cercospora, um, but I'm assuming they've looked at it and seeing that um, we're not using these widely for 
natural biocontrols, you can kind of tell in terms of what some of the data has been in terms of consistency of these products as biocontrol agents. But you know, it's one of the reasons why I looked at these particular class of products because it made more sense and because of some of the disease suppression to include these in this particular data set just to see if there was anything that we could find at this time. Uh, the other products are beneficial microorganisms. Um, this is again, the fastest growing segment in the industry at this particular point in time. And this is because of some of the new DNA techniques for analyzing what's in the rhizosphere around the roots. Um, these companies can isolate these microorganisms and try to engineer them to work better because that's one, one of the challenges, particularly with free living nitrogen fixers is to get them to have activity, particularly in situations where you're applying high rates of nitrogen. The more nitrogen you typically apply, the less effective many of these products are. So our 2020 research trial, the primary goal was to establish and do some fall spring comparisons, but we wanted to get some nitrogen rate data going in 2020. So I decided to look at um, some simple trials, looking at a, just a yes, no arrangement with two of these biostimulant controls. Uh, two locations we were at were Crookston and Wood Lake. Um, they were a full nitrogen rate study where we had six nitrogen rates at Crookston ranging from zero to 200 pounds of spring urea and from zero to 210 pounds at Wood Lake. The biostimulants were applied, um, we, we applied in a total of six gallons per acre of water plus starter fertilizer, which the starter we selected was uh, three gallons per acre of, of 626. Sourcing these products, um, it's amazing what you can find on Amazon. Um, the Kytosin product itself, um, I had substantial difficulty finding a product. Uh, the recommended rate for this product, which is called High Tide, it's um, 0.25 ounces per gallon. Uh, we used about double that with the, the product we had. So we used a 0.5 ounce per gallon rate for that itself. The end fixer product that we tested was this um, BioRed BioMate mix. Um, the rate we used was 60 ounces per acre of BioRed plus 22 and a half ounces of BioMate. The difference between these products, uh, the BioRed is primarily free living end fixers. Um, the BioMate contains sugars. So the mixture of these two, what I did that is for longevity of the product since we were mixing these ahead of time, uh, the BioMate had sugars that those end fixers could feed off of um, from the time where we mixed it versus the time of application. That was kind of the recommended practice for these products as well. So yield date on these sites, um, very unresponsive year at the Woodlake site at Crookston. Uh, we look at, um, and what I'm showing you the data here is applied N plus our four foot soil nitrate N, which if you look at the breakdown here, this is the two foot N here at the locations in the two to four foot, if you wanna break that down by the two and four foot range. But again, these uh, graphs are gonna show you the data of applied N plus the, the four foot N rate. At Crookston, uh, N response up to about 80 pounds of um, applied N plus soil N. At Woodlake, we're seeing uh, N responses anywhere from around 175 to that um, highest N rate we applied, which is around 240 pounds of total applied N. So looking at this data, this is just summarizing across the biostimulants because we saw no effect of the biostimulants at either site. And if we were gonna see them, I would especially expected to see responses at Wood Lake where we had such an N deficient situation where if we were gonna get some response from that free living N fixer, we should have seen it and we just did not at that given location. Recoverable sucrose per acre, um, if we break that down per ton, um, we're seeing a maximum um, recoverable sucrose at around the same nitrogen rates at maximized yield. The, the exception was at Wood Lake, where we didn't see any um, general effect of N, although if you look at the numbers, the numbers were much higher as we approached our highest application rates. And uh, the significance at the site was about 0.15, so we're close to our, our accepted significance of 0.1. And it follows kind of the same general trend we saw at Crookston at maximizing near that point at which where we maximized yield at that given site. On a per acre basis, um, similar to yield, um, looking at it around 80 pounds, um, recoverable sucrose per acre maximized at Crookston. And we saw a pretty linear response at the Wood Lake site. And that was an interesting site to kind of look at it. When we went out to that site, you really couldn't see the visual differences out there, but there were significant differences, particularly um, with the, the yield at that given like at that site. So the kind of the thing here, if you look at it, nothing that I would have expected to happen differently than we've seen in the past in the relationship between um, recoverable sucrose and also um, yield with our nitrogen rate response data. One of the questions I did receive about midsummer was looking at some of the emergence data. And we did um, look at um, emergence, this is emergence uh, percentage and I'm looking at just as applied N as urea. 
seeing a fairly significant decline in our emergence as we increase end rate at our given locations. And the only time we really saw some difference between the biostimulants is where we looked at um, slightly lower emergence at these higher end rates at Crookston and at Woodlake, um, the emergence was, was similar no matter what we had for treatments biostimulant or not. To put this in perspective though, that we know we, we did have a pretty substantial decrease in emergence. Um, it was about 20% reduction at Woodlake up to that 210 pound nitrogen rate, we also saw about a 40% increase in root yield. So if you put the two together, really um, you see a lot of compensation for that decreased emergence um, in um, the, the sugar beet flexing the, the root size and um, seeing larger roots per plant um, with, with that, redu rather that reduction in, in the emergence at these given locations. A couple of things we're looking at. Um, I had some questions last year on petiole nitrate concentration. We were looking at that. I took some samples in um, early to mid-July. Uh, this is just the data, kind of see the relationship between the two. Um, generally from this data, if we got above 850 part per million, we're at 100% maximum yield. Uh, the problem though is when we're, be we're below that point, we're anywhere from 50% up to 100%. So we had situations, uh, particularly a sister site that I don't have the yield data reported here, from uh, Lake Lillian, which was just a simple a nitrogen rate and a lay-by nitrogen study, um, where those had very low petiole nitrate concentrations, but very high yields. We had similar yield potential at that site, close to 40 tons, as what was seen at that Wood Lake site. So in general, in the biostimulants right now, we're kind of dropping that point and I'm shifting towards the fall spring application at this. Um, you know, I think it's gonna be pretty hit or miss. And I, I don't know with particularly with a, a crop with a, a deep taproot, if you're going to see as much of a benefit as, as you might see with a crop with a fibrous root system such as corn. Uh, disease pressure, we didn't assess that, but just with that, without lack of a difference in yield, I can't imagine just looking at that, that any of these products were giving us any benefit in terms of disease pressure. But again, it's two site years of data. This uh, usually these, these biostimulants, you need a lot of site years to kind of look at a um, probability model for many of these treatments. So end rate response now, it's one of the things this data will be included in the database. Um, I don't expect any large changes. I'll have been talking with John Lamb about, um, we're looking at at least updating the publication. I don't know where that's gonna go with the uh, nitrogen rate recommendations at this time. Um, however, um, the additional site years of data are, are really invaluable for us in looking at that, that overall evaluation. But again, it's something we're looking at. Um, I didn't have time to go through everything I have on biostimulants. Um, uh, Minnesota Crop News, I'm likely gonna be putting out a post here sometime here within the spring. So if you have any follow-up questions on that, um, it's a good source to look for. And at this, uh, Muhammad, if we have any um, time for questions, I can take a question or two. Thank you, Dan. You do have a minute or so. So if there are any questions, feel free, go ahead and ask Dan. If not, they will put uh, it in. Mohammed, there, there is one question for Dan. And uh, I am back in full capacity, so I can uh, take over as moderator as well. Thank Go you. Go ahead. And I can't see the question, so could you? Sure. Yeah, I'll read it for you. So where where we start where we start to find these biostimulant products to consider for production, sugar beet production, with a very wide definition of what these products are. So where's a good starting place to find information? Well, a lot of the issue right now is gonna be finding products that might be specific or crop specific. And that's one of the things, if you look at a lot of the work right now, there's a lot of work to isolate specific microbes that are in the rhizosphere of specific crops. And that's the challenge I had was when we started setting up the study was finding products that weren't corn specific because that's been kind of the king right now in terms of products, particularly these free living nitrogen fixers. There's a lot of work on on corn. So it's, um, you know, looking at it in terms of, of a web search, that's kind of what I went and I looked at um, some published data just to see what's out there to see it, but it's very limited right now. So um, the main thing would be just following up um, with, um, you know, some of the extension researchers to see what they know, particularly those of us that are on that NCRA 103 committee, uh, just to see because we're generally in tune with um, some of the products that are out there just to know kind of what's being marketed but we can't keep up with everything so they, it is a challenge because again i think if you look at these products they're going to be really tailored to specific crops and that's one of the things you're going to want to watch out for if you're using them because some things may not make sense for one crop and it may make more sense for another all right thank you our next speaker 
is, and I think she's, I see she's on the post. So uh, our, our paper, the next paper is liquid separated dairy manure in a sugar beet rotation presented by Dr. Melissa Wilson, the University of Minnesota. So Melissa, when you're ready, go ahead. Hi all, my name is Melissa. I'm an extension specialist and assistant professor and I work on manure management. So I wanna talk a little bit about a project that we started in 2019. So fall of 2019, we applied liquid separated dairy manure and wanted to see where in rotation it'd be beneficial for um, sugar beet. So as you know, a lot of the there's a lot of big dairies that are coming into Western Minnesota into sugar beet growing regions. And a lot of them are installing what's called a liquid separated um, system for their manure. So this is actually some screw presses that are in line. And the, you can see the dry material here, the dry material from the manure is actually recycled back into the barns as bedding. And then the liquid is what's applied to the land. And there is, there is some concern that it might release nutrients a little differently, and that's why we wanted to test this in the sugar beet rotation because we know that slow release of nitrogen, especially if that release happens late in the season, can be detrimental to sugar. So we started this location in fall 2019. We applied manure in near Murdoch, Minnesota, and then we also just started our second site this past fall up near Nashua, Minnesota. So I'm going to talk mostly about the results from the first year of the study where we started in Murdoch. So in case you're interested in wondering how we apply manure in small plots, you can see a picture. It's basically just a poly tote filled with manure lifted in the air and has a hose on the end of it. What we did is we wanted to apply similar rates to what the dairy was offering. So we applied a high rate. This ended up being about 14,400 gallons per acre. And the first year available nitrogen credit from that was 177 pounds of nitrogen, assuming about 55% of the total nitrogen was available. For the low rate, they were offering 9,500 gallons per acre. That ended up being about 85 pounds of nitrogen for first year credit. And then we compared that to the standard practice of adding spring fertilizer. So we had three different crops, corn, soybean, and sugar beet. And for all of these, if there were nutrients that were not met by the manure, say it was phosphorus or potassium, we did add spring fertilizers to those plots to balance that out. So essentially all of these had a very similar nitrogen rate when it came to corn or the sugar beet, but our soybean, we did not apply any additional nitrogen to with our spring fertilizers. For that one, we just applied phosphorus and potassium as needed. So overall, we tried to meet all of the baseline nutrient needs of the crops, but sometimes there were over applications of nutrients if it came with the manure. For the second and third year in this rotation, we're going to be doing just fertilizers. So we don't, we're not applying manure any other time. And we will take nitrogen credits and look at the soil test phosphorus and potassium as well and adjust our fertilizer needs based on those. So we also had a couple different crops, as I mentioned, and you'll see each one of these rows has either corn, soybean, or sugar beet. And then within each of these blocks, we have our high rate in six rows, our low rate in six rows, and our fertilizer in six rows. And then we had some buffer plots here too as well. Each crop was replicated four times. That's why you see four different blocks of these. And like I said, we just kind of finished up our first field year of data collection. We started seeing some nutrient deficiencies or differences pretty early in the season. This is an aerial photograph of our corn and I show here what was applied. So this is fertilizer only, this is low rate manure and this is high rate manure. I wanna note that this previous year was this whole field was planted to corn so it kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. Uh, overall, the corn definitely looks smaller where there was only fertilizer applied. It was bigger and there's more, a little bit more row closure in the low and high manure rates. And we saw a very similar pattern with our sugar beet as well. In this case, we have our high manure um, rows here, our low manure rate here, 
and fertilizers. And again, the top growth was much more robust where we had our manure application rates. And what's interesting is that we tried to match nitrogen for the fertilizers and the manure in both of these plots. But that was first year availability of nitrogen. So we don't know if more mineralization happened in this particular year or what was going on, but it was definitely interesting to see. Now, soybean was a different story. Soybean, this is our two manure applications, and then this is our fertilizer only. And you can see the fertilizer only was much more green and had a lot less of the iron chlorosis deficiency happening. Um, what, what we think happened is these are high pH soils. This is a pH of about 8, 8.1. And we added organic matter and we added nitrogen, which are both tend to drive IDC in high pH soils. And, you know, we didn't think about it. We didn't apply any kind of products to try to help with the um, iron or anything. So that was one of our mistakes that we need to rectify in the future. I always joke with people that my research sometimes is doing dumb things, so you all don't have to, and that was one of the dumb things we did. So I do not recommend applying manure prior to soybeans if you're not going to also apply some sort of iron chelation product or something like that. Here's a mid-season aerial photograph. Again, sugar beets look great, corn look great, soybean looks awful. It um, really took a hit and you can see exactly where we applied manure in most cases in those treatments. So I wanna talk about yield. Well, here we have our corn yield in this first graph over here from zero to 240 bushels per acre. Our fertilizer plots had a 207 bushel per acre yield. Our low manure rate was about 10 bushels per acre higher than that at 217. And our high manure rate was in between the two at 212. I didn't get a chance to statistically analyze these yet, um, but it does show you there's definitely differences based on our nutrient source for our corn yields. Soybean, as you probably expected, soybean yields were really low for our manure plots, only 13 and eight bushels per acre. Even our fertilizer plots yielded about 35 bushels per acre, which is a little low for the region. I think in 2019, the average for this area was about 45. So this is even a little bit low in these areas. And here we have our sugar beet yields. Uh, this is what I have at the top here is nutrient source yield in tons per acre, extractable sugar in pounds per ton of yield extractable sugar in pounds per acre, and percent sugar purity. So overall, we had some differing results. Interestingly, we had a lot more tonnage with our manure, or averaging about 35.7 tons per acre, versus our fertilizer only had 32.7. Um, the extractable sugar in pounds per ton of material definitely was lower with our manure averaging right around 290 to 89 pounds per ton versus with fertilizer only, it was 297. But because we had such higher amount um, yield or higher yields, our extractable sugar in pounds per acre was a lot higher with our manure, about 10,280 or 200 and, or 300 or so on average, versus we only had 9,710 pounds per acre with our fertilizer. And kind of as expected, we did have a bit of a purity hit with our manure. It was about 90.8% purity and the fertilizer resulted in 91.2. So definitely saw some interesting differences in the sugar beets. Uh, what were we up to next year? Well, as I mentioned, we applied manure last fall up in Nashua. Um, pretty happy with how that went. We think we should have a nice site up there for the next three years. And we'll also have our second year of the rotation next year. And hopefully our soybeans will not look like this next year. We will see if we can get some of the IDC issues worked out. But that is all I have. Thanks to the Research and Education Board for funding this. Uh, here's my contact info. If you'd like to see any of our other research that we're conducting in the manure group, 
check out this link, z.umn.edu slash manure research 2020. Get to catch up on everything we were doing this past year. All right, well, thank you, Melissa. Um, and uh, I really like that uh, we do dumb things so you don't have to thing. I'm, I'm gonna have to remember that. It's a good mantra. <laughs> okay, uh, on to our next speaker. Thanks for closing out. And uh, our, our uh, next speaker is Dr. Amitava Chatterjee with North Dakota State University. And he's gonna be asking and hopefully answering, should we incur a loss by interceding sugar beet? So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, if you are including this uh, interceding these cover crops in sugar beet production system, whether that is going to lead towards uh, the sugar beet yield loss in the, because as you know that if we are uh, including this interceding cover crops and cover crops growth need some nitrogen, water. So when we are cutting down those resources because of this interceding, whether that can lead to this sugar beet uh, affect this sugar beet production or not. Before we are, I'm just going too much deep. I just like to recognize that uh, our uh, co-authors that Shailesh, he is the graduate student. He moved to Penn State for his PhD, Marisol Barty from Department of Plant Science. She uh, actually kind of helped us to design this uh, research and cover crop and Norman Katanak to lay out our plots and then harvesting, he is dealing with all in all for this uh, and guiding student also. So why do we need to think about interceding cover crops in sugar beet? This picture is showing that how this beet field looks at the late fall if you don't have any protection for these fields. And as you can see, these soils are exposed to the wind erosion. So there can be a chance that significant soil is getting lost to the ditches and your ditch turns to the dirt. So for that reasons, we are thinking about that if we have some residue, some kind of uh, uh, protection against this wind erosion, then it can help to improve our soil health productivity for the long-term basis. So we interceded this rye and how it looks like in between those rows. Just I like to show you that picture. And this is that how it looks like just soon after harvest. So this sugar bit uh, after defoliation. And as you can see that these uh, residues, they are just lying in between those sugar beet rows. And uh, if you have a cover crop that overwinters, then you can see some growth during the late, uh, during the next early spring, during the snow melts, after the snow melt. And what it does that it can catch some nutrients from the leaching losses. So we have some benefits if we are having this interceding and uh, like rye or that wind overwinters, or if you have suppose like that winter kills, suppose uh, for like pea or cameline or mustards, they can protect some uh, so, uh, soil loss after the beet harvest. That is the main ambition or main goal. And if we have like a crop, uh, interceding cover crop that overwinters, they can actually reduce the nutrient losses in spring. So just let's talk about that. What are the cover crops we have? So we have four cover crop species. Uh, we have winter rye. We just uh, like seeded at 20 pounds per acre, camelina and mustard. Camelina six pounds per acre because it is a small seed, mustard 10 pounds per acre, and then pea because it's a bigger seed, 20 pounds per acre. Now the important thing is that in case of interceding, when we need to do this interceding. Because as you know, this sugar beet is Roundup ready. So you have to make sure that you apply this Roundup, just after this, you apply this Roundup ready, then you can uh, in, go for interceding. Now you can see this 2018, 19 and 20, we play a little bit with this interceding time. During this 2018 first year, we uh, interceded in June 21. Before the late interceding, we go up to July 11. And I will show you in the results at what happens if you are going a little bit late, like July 11. And just one thing in the mind that we have like 22 inch row spacing. So it's not like a bunch of spacing, like 30 inches of row spacing. You have some exposure to the sun. So there may be some growth and more room for the cover crop growth or late kind, less kind of nutrient cut off from this sugar beet. 
For 2019, so we just make it a little bit early, like June 13 for the early one and June 24 for the late planting. And then for the growing season, for the 2020, we have planted this early interseeding is done in June 18 and late interseeding in June 26. So it is closed, 2019 and 20 is closed. For all these years, we did this study at Ada. Now, the thing is that we actually have another side, but it did not work out. So I'm just going to show you that those solid results that we have at Ada. So we have four proper crop species, uh, rye, camelina, mustard, and pea. And then we have two interceding, early and late. Plus we have this control that is means without any cover crops. We have these things at three years at Ada, at different parts of the field of the brain farm. And we have previous crop, as a previous crop, we have spring wheat, all our alkaline soils. We applied nitrogen, 130 pounds of nitrogen and all recommended NPK for all these crops based on the two feet soil test. Then what we did, we measured the cover crop biomass at harvest means just before they are defoliating, uh, just a week before that thing, we harvested the cover crop biomass from this quadrant, two by two square feet quadrant. And we also measured the sugar beet root yield, sugar content. And finally, we kind of determine the economic return to find out that whether these growers, if they are having this interceding, because we are not getting any kind of monetary benefit or, or kind of incentive for having cover crops. We just want to know that whether we are having some loss from this interceding cover crop. So we have this RCBD and four replications, and we analyze these things in SAS 9.4 at P level of 95%. Before in Red River Valley, before we are talking about results, we need to first talking about the growing season condition. This is the growing season just at near about harvest, how the prosper site looks like where we have one of our site in 2019. So we did not really get good data from that thing. So we discarded that one. So these, today we are just going to, I have to talk about only for the ADA sites. 2018, it's really dry during the early growing season, as you can see from these square ones. And that is that all over the places. And these ones on the Y axis, I'm showing that deviation from the 30 year average rainfall. So as you can see, 2018, 19, and 20, all of this early growing season rainfall is comparatively less because they are like minus on the negative side. So they are like not below normal. But as you can see the late growing season, they are particularly for 2020, we got a bunch of rainfall during this August and they're almost similar in 2019. But in case of 2018, we see that we have less amount of rainfall during this July and August where we have planted. And that actually influenced our cover crop biomass. I just want to show you a short video that how the cover crop biomass harvest are during the defoliation looks like. Oops. So because why I showed you that one that because a lot of growers, they ask me questions that whether whenever you are doing the harvesting, whether it is affecting your uh, beet or not, whether it is going to give you any trouble with the defoliator. Just I like to let you know, because we have a bunch of biomass this year, we saw, we heard some sounds whenever it is defoliating because if it is, if it is wrangling in between those spokes, but before that, I did not hear that much of noise during this uh, defoliation or anything. So let's talk about the results. If we considered all three years, 2018 to 2019 and 20, we did not see any effect, significant effect of interceding time on this cover crop biomass, root yield, sugar concentration, and recoverable sugar yield. Same thing for this cover crop species. We did not see any kind of Effect. And as you can see that talk, I will talk about in next couple of slides, these statistics, you know, it is sometimes it is just like Mark was showing that, well, it's all non-significant, but it is good. Yes, because uh, all non-significant means we have no significant influence, either positive or negative on cover, due to cover crop on this, all these parameters. 
But what we observe that if you are considering the year versus this interceding, that is going to affect on all those things. So it depends on your growing season condition, which some years you can see some benefits of cover crop, some year it did not show you some cover crop effect. As you know, 2018 was dry, 2019, 20, we got some decent rainfall during the late growing season. So we will see some effect on those things. So it depends, varies from year to year. There is not like that. If you are thinking about all over like 10 years, 15 years, well, we'll see that no effect. But if you are going for the individual year basis, there will be some effect. Early always have more biomass than late growing season. As you can see, 2019 and 2018, 19 and 20, whenever you are doing this early interceding, they, they have more cover crop biomass than this uh, late growing season. And another thing is that, as you can see that if you are comparing pea, camelina, mustard and rye, pea and rye have generally have this higher biomass than this camelina and mustard. But if you are thinking about the next one, after this P and R, mustard had higher biomass in 2020 as compared to camelina. Again, if you are going for this three year average, just because of this 2018 was really low yield, we did not see that much of year effect, three year effect. But as uh, what I think that we need to see that individual years. Next one is that if we include in the treatment, no cover crops, those all the statistics that I talked about in early, this that is going to compare because we are having this factorial RCVD. So we take out this control plot or no cover crops. Even if we are including this co no cover crops or control, then we can see that only 2019 has some effect on this yield and sugar. And what is that one? If you are having this early planting, particularly for rye and for brown mustard, then we can see there is a, some a significant declining yield for this uh, sugar beet root yield. But let's see that what is happening with the sugar content. As you can see that if you are having this sugar, means including this cover crops, there is some kind of rise in sugar content, but it is not significantly different from this no cover crop. But for late planting, as you can see, that some of those ones are really little bit getting affected, but not again, not that much of different because there's all are ABC, except for Camelina, they have, they are, they are all sig uh, kind of not significant. But if you are seeing this root yield for the late one, as you can see, they are not significantly different from this no cover crop. So if you are going for this late planting with any cover crop, then there is not much difference with the yield and sugar. But if you are going with this early planting, just after you apply this Roundup Ready, then for this rye and this particularly pea, you can see and brown mustard in some years they can affect because if they are having bunch of cover crop biomass, they can take out the nitrogen. And as you know, sugar beet in among the nutrients, all essential nutrients, they are very sensitive about this uh, nitrogen. So if you are taking out the nitrogen uh, cover crop, then it might affect in your yield. Let's see about this cover crop economic profitability. I have this economic profitability that how much return from the uh, this American Crystal Sugar, they provided me the data for their payment. And I just included that thing in my calculation. And this plus signs or minus signs, they indicates that how much it is different from this no cover crops. In case of 2018, you can see all plus because we didn't have that much of cover crop biomass. But as you can see from this 2019, if you are having this early rye or this brown mustard or pea, because of this, uh, as I mentioned, that it can reduce your recoverable sugar yield. So it is showing up in case of that it you have some loss out there. But if you are going for late, late planting, there is not that much of difference or like, I would say there is not much effect on this economic return. In 2020, we did not see any kind of effect on this um, uh, economic effect on economic profitability due to this interceding with these cover crops. So just before ending, I just want to point out that if you are having this case of this early rye, or if you are going with the mustard, then that can reduce your yield, particularly for one growing season that happened. 
So conclusion from this three year study, this late interceding of cover crops had no negative effect on economic return, yield or sugar. If you are thinking about this amount of biomass or that residue that is going to be left over after your harvest, P and rye that have huge biomass, cover crop biomass, depending on, again, depending on the rainfall that it gets, followed by the mustard, then the camelina has the lowest one. But one thing we need to remember that camelina has an upright one. So it is, and uh, they also need some nutrients. So it has the less amount of biomass, but P, they roll on the ground and this rye, they are really kind of uh, withstand with the less amount of nutrient and water. So they have this more biomass growth. Depending on amount of cover crop biomass produced, early interceding, particularly by rye and pea, can reduce the economic return and cost involved with this interceding and ecosystem services from proper crops are, we did not consider that thing. We don't know that how much you can save with this soil erosion loss. And those are the things that we need to consider before we are making an overall kind of uh, conclusion. Thanks, Mark. If we have, if I have any time for question, I'll be happy to take those ones. Thanks, Amitabha. Yes, you do have time for one question. There is one in the message board or in the chat and, uh, or a question answer. And okay. it's- I cannot see that thing. Can you just- Sure, I'll, I'll read it for you. Um, how did you plant, uh, just uh, they may have missed it, but uh, how did you plant the interseeded crop? What kind of planter seeder did you use? It's a good question. Well, you know, Mark, sometimes we did it by hand uh, with a hoe and kind of imitating with that planter that is our interceder that is available in the market. Uh, but for the small row, small plot, and particularly for 22 inch row spacing, there is not a interceder for that thing. But for 30 inch row spacing, there is an interceder. So in our case, we did it by hoe, hand hoe. So it is really kind of. Uh, uh, exhausting, but uh, well, that we did. And just to add one thing that uh, um, I think MET, they have a interceder for this cover crop interceder, but I don't know in details that what is the cost or anything about that, whether it is available in the market or not. But one unit that they give it to Marisol Barty that I know of. And yeah, in future, in next year, I'm, I have two new cover crops, winter wheat, and flax. So that we are going to play with for the next year. Ahmed, this is Tom. Yes. Maybe you, maybe your seeding rate was too high. Have you considered backing off on your seeding rate? That's a good question. Yeah, you know, again, I, I have not played with the seeding rates. It is just like we just go in the, like, it will be really good study if we can play with that seeding rates and see that how it is affecting. We planted it really thick, I, that I can tell you, and you are correct in that one. And it will be good study to kind of play with that one, that how it is, uh, it will be affecting. Very good, thank you. All right, uh, we will move on to the next presentation and uh, that is entitled Integrated Integrating cover crop and strip tillage to improve soil health update. And it's presented by Jody DeYoung Hughes of the University of Minnesota. Next year, we'll have a lot more data to show you. This year, what happened in 2019 is it just, um, or in 2019, not 2020, we got the grant in the spring of 19 and was hoping to uh, get this uh, project going, but it just rained and rained and rained and we could not get in to get in our cover crops in the three locations that we were at. So we postponed it a year and the three locations that we have, we have Wayne Formula near Granite Falls and we have Noah Hultgren, which has a field near south of Danvers. And then we also have Brian Ryberg while, and he gave us a field even 20 miles further away from my home. Thank you, Brian. And <laughs> it's near Winthrop. And we had three treatments and it's replicated three times, 22 inch rows, the full length of the field. And it most all three fields were around 23 or four acres in total. And the one practice was whatever they normally use. And so for two of them, that's chisel plow or disc ripping ahead of time. And then uh, one was strip till after the corn. Okay, I'll back up just a little bit. This year is corn. And so um, in the fall after harvest, they will either chisel or disc rip. The second treatment is they'll do strip till. 
The other treatment was that we uh, put in early season cover crops, and then we're going to strip till this fall, and then uh, late season cover crops strip till in the fall. So those are our four treatments. And we got all of them interseeded in the V3, V4, and we used the uh, machine, uh, Carson Klosterman came down from Fargo. He also, he's the owner of Strip Till For You. And he made this uh, toolbar for us and brought it down and all three sites used it. And we put in crimson clover and annual ryegrass so that they can live underneath the canopy. And we don't expect them to overwinter. And I wanna thank Carson truly for this because he did not charge us to use this machine and for transportation or for the use of it. And we lost the lid to his fertilizer tank and he was very nice about not charging us. So that was, it was a good, good person to work with. Uh, the Ryberg farm, now since he doesn't do a lot of tillage, he does mainly strip till, uh, he has a broadcast, in, uh, not interseeder, but a broadcaster for the cover crops. And we compared that to the, uh, when we go in and drill it instead. So that was just a little different thing that we did on his place. All the crops germinated, all the cover crops, which was great to see. You can see here, um, a lot of them look just like this. And so then we went out to Brian's and we took an app, it's called Canapeo, and went and you take a picture straight down onto the, the floor and it will decide how much of it is cover crop or you know, green material versus soil. And so you can see here at 3%, here's, it looks at this here and it turns it into this image here. And the one down below is broadcast and the one up above is uh, drilled or interseeded. At 5%, you can see that, uh, you know, a little bit more out there. And again, the broadcast is down below. And then 10%, but 9% for the the broadcast, we, did, we didn't get a 10% in the broadcast, but really 9%, 10% isn't a big deal. It was very variable throughout the field on how, you know, what was our averages. And I think most of them were around 5%, but they did grow um, and they were there this, this winter too. Then on September 9th, uh, we had a field day and Rantizo Drone was there. I was trying to find an interseeder or a Heggy or a tall boy or something that I could get into the field and was looking all summer and I could find one for 30 inch rows, could not get one for 22s. So uh, Rantizo said that they would come and they would fly it on with a drone and see how that worked out. And that was fun to learn. It took, it took a while for <laughs> setting up baby lines and, and the tank, we had to go over it three times to get the rate that we wanted. The tank isn't big, very big. So it could go down and then we it would come back to fill up and it, it takes a while, but it got the job done and it did a very nice job and you know, it went exactly where it needed to be. And so it was exciting kind of to use that. And what was nice about that is they brought it up and they didn't charge us the transport or the person. We just had a, a little bit of uh, time in there but not for his travel time. And this is a cover crop plot that, um, you remember it snowed really early in uh, October and we're like, oh gosh, I don't have any of my tillage in yet. And we went out there and was kicking around and we could still see cover crop was growing. And this was the late season cover crop, or I'm sorry, the early season cover crop had pretty good growth. And the late season that we put on with the drone had, it, it was not as robust. So we'll have to see what happens. And we were able to plant in the, or not plant, uh, till in the snow with disc ripping, but I wasn't gonna do that with strip till. And, and we had to wait a little bit for the strip tiller anyway. And luckily it warmed back up, snow was gone, soils were ready, and we went back in. At Wayne's place, uh, Carson Klosterman again brought down a strip tiller and we did it and it was a little muddy and it, I think we're going to need a secondary pass this uh, this spring to kind of just freshen it up and get it ready for sugar beets. Um, I don't want to say we have to stick to one pass and then have a horrible emergence. It doesn't make sense. So, um, but otherwise, uh, Brian's look good and Noah's look good, and I we're all ready for spring. I, I it's actually very nice that all three plots everything worked out really well. 
So Striptel may need a secondary pass this spring. We'll, we'll evaluate that when we get closer. Um, the disc grip or the chisel plow plots will have to have a field cultivation to get them ready for planting. And then after everything's uh, ready, we're going to assess how much of the cover crops grew and continue to grow and seedling damage. So after we plant, we'll go back out there and, and rate that. And we will also do a weed pass too to see um, did the rye help smother out and have a high enough biomass that maybe we don't need our first pass of herbicides. Don't, don't quote me on that. I'd get in so much trouble with the university. So we're gonna see uh, you know, what kind of benefits we could get. And then of course, we're gonna to go to yield and um, I'm kind of excited about all that. We're a year late, but it's, um, I think it was worth it because this year was really nice and, and we got uh, some really, everything got in very timely. So uh, do I have any questions? Jody, you have awful lot of corn residue on the surface. Are you worried about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had really good yields. Um, no, I'm not. Uh, that's, what, that's also when we'll evaluate if we need a secondary pass or not, mainly just to push the residue to the side off the berm so that the, the sugar beet has pretty much a black berm to plant into. Other questions for Jody? Okay, uh, yes, we do have one in the Q&A thing, and uh, they were asking about what your row spacing was. 22 inches for all three. Okay. I'm really pleased with how many people stayed on uh, a full the full day. A uh, wonderful crowd. Um, uh, excellent questions were asked as well. Um, I guess uh, maybe I should open it up for questions for any of the other speakers. If you didn't get an opportunity, uh, if you have one for Jody, something comes to mind, please uh, do ask. If you want to know the soil, that's a soil up by Crookston behind me there. Okay. That uh, uh, Larry Smith had some color colorful words for some of the soil up there, I recall. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> All right, good afternoon again. Thank you, Mark, mm -hmm. for carrying through. Um, we have some people, we'd like to thank those people, especially from Europe. I saw Anja is still on in Serbia. So thank you for staying. It's about 11 o'clock over there. Time to drink some milk, tea, or whatever cold beverage you like at this time. I saw Ann Fenwick and um, a lot of our colleagues uh, from Michigan, from Idaho, Oliver, uh, Peter Regetnik, uh, thank you for staying on. Sorry we can't have you here uh, this year, but hopefully we'll have you around next year. Dr. Albert Sims, uh, thank you for your service to the uh, industry and the university. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. J uh, Jacob uh, Butkin, congratulations on your award. Dr. Tom Peters, congratulations on your Distinguished Service Award. All my fellow researchers, thank you. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for presenting the research. And then thank you for making this information available to our producers. As we indicated earlier, we'll have recordings for you, um, especially for the board members if they need to look back at any specific uh, area. So as soon as I have that available, I will let you know. Uh, thanks to um, and do that. I would like to thank uh, Sumitomo Corporation for their sponsorship, the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board for their funding, NDSU and University of Minnesota administrators uh, for continuing to support this joint program. I think is exemplary and more states, uh, neighboring states should probably be doing uh, this kind of a, a, an arrangement. Uh, thank you all. It was good to see so many different names uh, who participated. Special thank you to our colleagues from Europe who were able to join us this morning. And for those, I have a lot of people from uh, Sweden and Germany and France and as I said, Sorbia who are still on. Thank you for staying to the end.